In this episode of the How to Do Your 20s podcast, I'm really excited. We're going to be talking about jujitsu. I have Dave Camarillo here, who is the man when it comes to jujitsu. If it's Tim Ferriss' go-to guy when it comes to jujitsu. So first off, Dave, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, thanks for the interest. I appreciate it. So let's get started with your story. How did you get involved in jujitsu in the first place? Uh, I started when I was 19, but uh, in jiu-jitsu, but it was only because I was injured and I was unable to do what we call nawaza, or I'm sorry, tachiwaza on the, on the stand-up in judo because that was my previous art or my first art. I started when I was five years old in martial arts. My father was my instructor, and I was pretty hardcore into judo, but at the time, at 19 years of age, I started get, getting uh, Ajgood slaughter, I think it's called, in my knees, and I just had a lot of rough, uh, had a rough time. So uh, when you do something as physical as judo and you get really antsy when you're not doing it and I was really antsy and I think that's a personality type anyway with me so I filled my uh my free time not able to do tachiwaza which is the throwing with jujitsu and that's how I started jujitsu and I saw at the time uh you know fighting was just starting kind of this is 21 years ago so I, I saw Ralph Gracie had a, an academy uh somewhat close to me I lived in Fresno at the time so uh, I started training there. And for your average listener, why should someone, let's say this, your average 20-year-old, take jujitsu? I personally think it's really powerful, but I'd love to hear from you why jujitsu is so important. Uh, for many aspects. I mean, there's there's two main, I would say, presentations of jujitsu. There's the sport aspect, which is, I think, the reason why it's growing so much. Um, and then that is an aspect of mixed martial arts. So the sport aspect has helped people transition into MMA which again has helped launch uh, or, or uh, fuel jujitsu's rise because they kind of coincide with one another. The other aspect is, uh, or the other pathway I would say is, is self-defense jujitsu. So when we say jujitsu, there's really two pathways. There's the sport aspect, which is governed by the IBJJF or whatever rules that you're following, which has tremendous ruling to help the uh, safety of the individuals doing it. But also, uh, people adhere to those rules, and it, I always say rules dictate behavior. So, when you do sport jujitsu, you are doing sport jujitsu. So, for example, one of the rules in sport jujitsu is you can jump to your back and engage and be aggressive in a match in like two seconds once the match starts. In a self defense confrontation, that's the exact opposite of what you want to do. You want to stay grounded in your feet. You want to increase your options with mobility and uh, in controlling space between you and an opponent. So when we do self-defense jiu-jitsu, we practice under self-defense situations. So we specifically practice for uh, the situation that we're at hand. So there's really two pathways, and I think um, it's an art that anyone can do. It's an art that helps law enforcement, military, mixed martial artists, three-year-olds, 60-year-olds, and you can do it continuous forever. I've studied many arts. Uh, obviously, I've trained fighters. When I was with AKA, I still train fighters. So I've been exposed to so many different, I would say, perspectives and, and again, wrestling and all these other things, Muay Thai. And it, those are arts that are great, but you can't do those forever. You know, it's, this is kind of uncontroversial. Jiu-Jitsu is one of those things that you can do pretty much, you know, as long as your heart's beating, you can do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I actually, I read the book. One of the reasons I was so excited to get into jujitsu is I read the book Mastery. I, for, I forget the name of the author off the top of my head, but it's basically this idea that you should have skills in your life that you can never finish, that you can constantly are going to be mastering. And that was one of the reasons I was interested in jujitsu was this idea that I could do it. I, I've seen videos of, uh, I forget the guy's name, the, the great, the, the grandfather Gracie doing jujitsu at 80 years old. And I'm like, all right, that's, I want to be able to do that. Elio Gracie, yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. So let's get down to some of the more tactical things. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see beginners make when they first try to start doing jujitsu? Uh, I think, wow, that's a loaded question because <laughs> essentially beginners make a lot of mistakes. And the way I look at it is there, there's a kind of a traditional answer to that, and then there's my answer, and it, they kind of contradict yeah. each other. So there's the traditional answer is the first thing you want to do, we'll talk about that, what you should want to do is survivability. So you really focus on your defense. And the way I look at that, I think that's that's a good approach. I think uh, people should work their defense. The crazy thing is I show very little defense in my academy. And my mentality is if I focus on offense, 
And it's very much like I wrote an article, um, when you work with your hands, you develop calluses, which is a natural, I would say, reaction to working with your hands. Well, it's the same thing if I train everybody, I'm an arm bar specialist, let's say, and I do arm bars and I'm really focusing, which is what we do at Gorilla Jiu Jitsu, really focusing on arm locks. Well, what's going to happen to the students? They're going to get arm locked a lot when they're a white belt, not as much when they're blue belt. And they're, they're going to naturally develop the nuances. The defense technique wise is very simple. I can give you two ways to defend an arm bar, but it's being there under the experience and under the gun, so to speak, with someone who's had so much information on the attack. Mm. So what we try to do is reinforce the attack. So what do, what do I would say new students do to make that mistake? I think uh, maybe they convolute things by trying to learn everything. We live in the age of YouTube. So they go on YouTube and that becomes part of their supplemental kind of part of their knowledge base, which is okay. But I sincerely believe in essentially what learning is. Learning is a process of indoctrination. And I think people should be indoctrinated, uh, when, and that should be with everything, indoctrinate yourself. Uh, and there's a difference between asking a question and, and questioning. So if you make a statement about your job and I just start questioning it, I'm not learning from you. I'm, that's almost attacking you. Mm -hmm. It's unraveling the knowledge base that what you're sharing with me by doubt when I have no base to understand what you're talking about, because that's what you do, not what I do. So the idea is when you indoctrinate yourself, you, you should simplify what you do and then take the instruction, ask questions to clarify the instruction so that you understand it and then immerse yourself. Mm. Don't question it. Go through that through a period of time, which really strikes a chord with a lot of people because their idea is like, we should question everything. If you question everything, you learn nothing. Mm. So the idea is to ask questions, clarify, immerse yourself in an extended period of time. Then you become on a platform of a little bit of knowledge where you can start questioning uh, the way the world is and the way jiu-jitsu is and all of the other things. So I'm going to have to uh, question a lot of things right now. But Let's for the sake, of, the sake of the podcast, for take that, I, I want to go through a couple different scenarios. And uh, for instance, the first one would be, what one takedown, if you could only teach, if you had to teach a beginner one takedown and they could spend years and years mastering it, what one takedown would it be and why? It would be uh, the body lock. And the idea with the body lock is because if you look, so for example, I've done judo, I've done wrestling, and I've really folk and really analyzed wrestling. And essentially, I try to simplify in terms of making a framework for understanding things. And the framework, we talk about pathways. There's really two pathways if we look at wrestling for MMA or for anything else. There's High intensity and low intensity. High intensity is your low shots where people are like really explosive and you're in your 20s. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like you're 20 years old and you're like, I'm 40. I've done all that. Your neck starts taking a, you know, a pounding. And, and, and when you're young, you don't really think of accumulative damage. And, and, and maybe my style is not so good when I'm 40 and 50. Um, but that's high intensity wrestling, which is essentially based on uh, a decent amount of youth, but also, uh, you know, athleticism and speed and all these things that you can develop and can be very powerful for you. The other side of that is the low intensity. Well, more Damian Maya to give you an example. So you have like maybe uh, uh, Koshek was a very high intensity wrestler in mixed martial arts to give people a frame of reference. They can Google this and look at it. Um, and then Damian Maya is, is outstanding at low intensity wrestling. And what he essentially uses is the body lock. So he'll get a good grip, hold on to you and you can't get away. And he'll slowly work his way very efficiently. So he's uh, very efficient with his energy, and he's also accomplishing his goal, which is getting you down. Now, why is that good for beginners? Number one, it's slow. Mm -hmm. When you're a beginner, you should you should I would say invest in systems and things that are that are slow, that slow your opponent down, that aren't rapid and fast. The more experience you have, you can build up to that. Um, and you can make low intensity wrestling very fast. But the idea is to get a hold of your opponent, which is creating a situation where you're in a hub, which is where you have a degree of control and options. And it's that's an easy hub to have because they're right in front of you and they necessarily can't get away, especially if you have dominant grips. Mm -hmm. So that starts with gripping. So have good underhooks, get good uh, controlling of the wrists. That hand fighting is extremely important to get to that body. Like once you're there, you can relax, slow things down, take a breath, and then apply some knee bumps or inside trips or things like that and keep it really, really simple because your opponent can't just jump away from you at that point.
And I'm, I'm going to ask the same question with submissions. I know you're, I know a lot of times white belts shouldn't be focusing too much on submissions, but you're actually a big fan of uh, teaching offensive. So what one submission should the white belt learn and really try to practice over the years? Uh, well, rear naked choke because it's, it's uh, universal. I'm very big on universal skills. Uh, so for example, I mean, we can have a, we can talk nine hours on you throw a technique out and I'll tell you where, what, in what context can it be used and in what other context that it's, it's a low ratio. So for example, the heel hook mm -hmm. in a self-defense commentator, I mean, the heel hook is essential. I mean, I'm saying heel hook cause everyone's heel hook crazy these days, right? The heel hook is awesome. I did heel hooks way back when I trained with Oleg Tokhtarov and, and uh, Gokor Chavichian way back in the day. And I was, I loved heel hooks, but these days it's really reserved for an extremely niche market, which is like EBI rules or something to that effect. In a self-defense confrontation, the heel hook is like your last ditch effort. I can't get up. Okay. I'm going to attack your leg. But even then, why would I spend so much time on a heel hook when it's low ratio in a self-defense confrontation? So when I talk about universal, the rear naked choke, I can do it gi, I can do it, sorry, this thing's not going to fit in my ear. I can do it, it's because of my cauliflower ear. I can do it gi, I can do it no gi, I can do it under any rules, any sanctioned rules. I can do it in mixed martial arts. I can do it on the street to save my life. So the rear naked choke I think is extremely good, and then any collar choke is really, really good because they're all right there once you have that dominant position. Um, but then, of course, arm locks. I mean, I, I don't think there's a single submission. I think the idea more is develop something like a go-to where you create a reputation for yourself that shocks and rattles your opponent that gives you other opportunity for other submissions. I think that framework in terms of like more conceptualized or philosophical approach is really good. For me, it's the arm lock, mm. like the Kimura grips. If I, I, have a, I have a saying, if I can touch you, I can, I can submit you. Um, and that's what you want to build towards. But I think really what helps me out is people know I'm going to go after their arm. If we and you roll, we're, I'm going to go after your arm, right? So I, they, they already have that in the back of their head. So when I start going after it, they think, okay, well, Dave, just, Dave's probably pretty good at arm locks. I've seen maybe this and that. And they're going to get rattled. Once they get rattled, they kind of shut down. And then I can attack all kinds of other things. So this will be the last question of this style that I ask, but another position I know a lot of white belts, including myself, find ourselves in is a closed guard. And if there's one guard pass that uh, someone should learn right from the gate, what would it be and why? Okay, so let me, let me clarify what you're saying. Um, your question, you cannot pass a closed guard. It's physically impossible. You have to open it first. Yeah. And I say that a lot because, you know, I think it's more of my personality. I'm very, I'm analytical and I, I'm like, man, this has to make sense to me. So, and I want it to make sense because I teach, if there's a hundred people in the room, they got to kind of get what I'm talking about. So you're, you're saying the top guy is in the closed guard. What does he do? I mean, yeah, I guess best technique for opening the guard. So the opening the guard without a doubt, I call it knee on guard break, knee on. So your knee actually goes on the sternum it's kind of like uh, between the, the belly and, and chest sternum so i stand up twist my body with good proper grips and i drive my knee around your hip and it touches down where my lead hand is that way i can let go of my lead hand secure your hips and then secure the leg that i want to put pressure the twisting helps put pressure on your lock which is your close guard to finalize things, my left hand should be there. I do it with my right knee, so my left hand is opening that guard. So I call it knee on guard break. It's the one where you twist, bring your knee around the hip, and you know drop pressure on your opponent's sternum. Awesome. It, okay. It, to people who don't do jiu-jitsu, that sounds uh, <laughs> probably pretty uh, aggressive, but um, essentially it, it twists their body up to open that lock. From there, if you ask me, well, what passes do I do? Well, it should transition from that guard break. Yeah. So we call it the knee through. We can drive the knee through right into a pass or I can go to my stack pass. All right. So I want to go into a little bit more of a – it might be a more long-winded answer on this one, but it's a very Tim Ferriss-esque question. But if you had 12 weeks to train someone, and let's say someone like me that has a little bit of experience, about a year of jiu-jitsu experience, and I wanted to compete at – let's not make it super impossible – a blue belt competition, which is definitely above what I'm doing, like the – blue belt world's competition 12 weeks one million dollars i'm like hey if i win this i'll give you a million dollars because in this scenario i'm rich what would the training look like up to that well i think uh <laughs> i think what you want to do is 
and re regardless if it's 12 weeks or whatever it is, is corral your opponent to where you're strong. Mm -hmm. So then the real, the real question is, is in three months, what area of jiu-jitsu can we actually invest our time and make you strong? And the idea behind jiu-jitsu is to slow your opponent down. In reality, like uh, especially someone who's been if, because if you're talking blue belt, they've been training a year and a half, two years at this point, could be three years, four years, because people are like at blue belt for a long time because they want to win. Um, so you could be facing people who are pretty good. So corralling them in one position and then pinning your way into a because the idea is just to keep the the uh, the referee off your back. Mm -hmm. So the, so what I would say is get your double leg, allow close guard, neutralize that position. Work towards what we already talked about, the neon guard break. Lower your level and do low-based passing, which leads to a pinning, which is just neutralizing your opponents. See, I would say focus on the, the I would say the most conception, one of the most con uh, primary concepts of jiu-jitsu is neutralization. So get them to the ground, close guard, no problem, neutralize their attack game, open their guard, and slowly work your way. I say melt into the next position. And the idea is to is to do it under a mode where a referee is standing over you to prepare for the competition, and he will call you on stalling the second that he feels it's stalling. So in your head, you know how to push that envelope. You get right to it, then you start attacking again. Mm -hmm. Because the idea, if you come in aggressive with only three months' experience, your opponent's gonna gonna wreck you. He's gonna have a lot of opportunity to uh, to submit you or just outpoint you. And transitioning from there, what are some of the biggest mistakes or myths you see when it comes to beginners training in jiu-jitsu? Uh, biggest myths? Um, <laughs> there's, uh, there's so many. Uh, what are the biggest myths in jiu-jitsu? Uh, that t okay, here's the – I would say the largest overall. Black belts fall into this issue as well. That technique is this – magical force in the world that will destroy everything in this path people i think it it's a romantic idea it's this emotional idea that people start internalizing because a lot of people talk about you know technique is it it rules everything in reality if you want to be a high level competitor like no world champion is not athletic in jiu jitsu they're all athletic. A lot of them are on steroids. A lot of them are pushing those envelopes in terms of like CrossFit type workouts. They are machines. And they put a tremendous amount of technique on top of that. And they have experience dealing with types of games that, that they'll face in that high level competition. Put all that together. That's why they, they're successful. The other one is, and I'm big on this, that ego is the enemy. Mm. I, I don't – I read the book, Ego's the Enemy. Um, we're gonna about to do a podcast on my podcast about it, Position Impossible. I do not believe ego is the enemy. I think at first you have to define what you're talking about. Ego to me is self-interest. We wouldn't be doing jiu-jitsu if it wasn't for self-interest. We wouldn't be excelling at jiu-jitsu if it wasn't for self-interest. So when we talk about like technique being this holy grail, which it isn't, there's many, we call it many variables to success, and the ego is actually a major component of success. Now, is it possible uh, to be a jerk and like upset your training partners and derail yourself from success? Yes, but I don't call that ego. I call that delusional immaturity. Now, that's just being immature. That's being, you know, someone you don't want to hang out with. Uh, I think, you know, the whole idea of e leave, leave your ego at the door. Well, if my league ego stayed at the door and I walked into a jiu-jitsu academy, I wouldn't walk into a jiu-jitsu academy. So the idea is it fuels you. And when you're in the last 30 seconds and you're down two points, it's you and them. And that's what's great about jiu-jitsu and other combative sports. It's not me with a team. It's me versus you. And I have to many times, yeah, apply my technique, apply my strength. But in reality, it's, it's a war of attrition and I got to outwill you. And a lot of that is based on ego. So let me ask you too. We mentioned earlier that a lot of one of the mistakes that white belts make is they go they learn go to YouTube and learn a bunch of random techniques. How should a how should anyone in jujitsu learn outside of the gym? We all know that the best way to learn is with another person. But if you want to do a little extra homework at home, what's the best use of your time? I I think uh, I think in the beginning is we talk about like indoctrination. 
do six months where you don't do that. Mm. Okay. And you come three days a week. So we're putting a time frame on it. If you're three days a week and you go in and again, it, it's relative to the structure of where you train. Like we're very structured here. So I believe in, cause I, I train uh, military law enforcement and I develop curriculum amongst cur- so many curriculums for different situations, different peoples with different rules of engagement. So the idea behind that is I believe in a very structured curriculum, extremely structured, structured one, two, three, that's success. And I believe in something that is constantly evolving because situations, opponents, you know, war evolves, uh, law enforcement situations evolve, uh, self-defense encounters evolve, opponents evolve. There's different body types. We're de- My least favorite body type to deal with is someone who's really lanky and good, of course. I don't like that. I got to really be A game. If I deal with someone who's a little bit more stocky, I'm going to run through them because I'm, my pinning and my arm bars, well, my arm bars wouldn't be so effective. on. You see how body types totally adjust. So the idea is, I think, in the beginning, six months, indoctrinate yourself. Don't look at YouTube. Then slowly let YouTube and then other influence into your game. But don't ever forget because I've, I've seen people totally like rehaul their game, revamp their game and forget a lot of their – basics which like i'll roll with them i'm like man you used to do this really well but now you're not and i think there's a little bit of that convoluted situation going and now i'm catching you in this armbar over and over again let's get back to your basic let's get back to the conceptual understanding of of mixed martial arts of jujitsu or of whatever it is at your gym what is that first six months those three days a week and we can do very broad strokes here what does that training progression look like i mean do you start with like day one teaching them how all the different positions or where does it go well our initial program is self-defense so we we say okay so what is self-defense self-defense is me with the ability the situation awareness the reaction speed the anticipation of what to expect if somebody's grabbing me grabbing my wife trying to hurt me um at least empty hand then weapons is a whole nother level uh, you can't arm lock a bullet, I say, right? So when we're talking about self-defense for jiu-jitsu, it's self-defense against somebody grabbing me, for example. Mm-hmm. And so the idea behind jiu-jitsu is we counter those, the, I would say, the primary uh, used methods to grab somebody. Grab them on the head. Grab. So we're countering those things. So it's very – it's not like just mount. We mm-hmm. definitely learn a mount series, which I think is the basis to all sports series. You'll see some crossover. But there will be like a structured curriculum that – Day one, day two is the same exact class. You're getting reps in that. And then it's day three, day four. So we kind of make sure that you're not – we make sure that, number one, anyone can jump in at any time. And it's not like this is beyond my capabilities. So that's the idea. And that it's basic enough and straight to the point and highly functional. And that's the idea behind our curriculum. Now, outside of that, we get into – whatever you want spinning upside down flying arm locks or whatever you know when you're 20 you can do a flying arm lock when you're 40 and you just start okay we'll work on this but the ideas are something for everybody so once someone does get past those six months come in three days a week what kind of resources uh, obviously you have you have books uh other than I mean, we can include your books in there but other than your books what other resources would you recommend someone looks at uh, i i mean youtube you know, I, you know, I believe in a spectrum. I believe in a time and place, you know. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think YouTube, because you can just go on YouTube and just hashtag something or, or type in something, omoplata, whatever it is, and see all different kinds of things. A lot of these guys are coming out with websites that are really, really good. Some that exist today, Marcelo Garcia and, and others that are just outstanding work. We are doing the same. So um, our idea is to release this uh, this portal that we have that has – both the self-defense and the sport aspect to it. Um, I think any of these avenues is, is really good to supplement. And, and that's the key word, though. It's supplement. It's a, you're supplementing. Um, like when in the Karate Kid, when he says, you learn karate from a book, that's, that's fine. But it's difficult to learn from just a book. Absolutely. You need an academy. You need a home. You need a place, like-minded people, with people you trust because you need good resistance. You need – here's what you need. You need good partners. And what, I, what do I mean by that? You need – appropriate levels of resistance that do this, that have a, I call it the balance intensity rate, that have a balance, a balance between high functionality out of the, out of the training session and low ratio of injury, if any. Mm. And that's what you need. And the higher level guys are probably better partners than, than most. But to me, it's the culture of the academy that 
puts that in motion. Either it's walk in and it's knockout drag out, and that's the way the instructor wants it. And there are plenty of jiu-jitsu academies that are like that. Guerrilla jiu-jitsu is a little bit more because I'm big on first impressions and people not getting wrecked and people becoming all-inclusive. Come on in, bring it in. So you have controlled intensity levels, and I always say, I would say match your intensity to who's in front of you, period. So have that. When we talk about ego, we balance that a little bit with, man, you're, you're here for them, not just for you. Um, it, definitely, if you're trying to choke me, I, I don't want to get choked. But the idea is we are there for each other. And that's the culture that really, I would say, resonates into me what traditional martial arts stands for. Guerrilla jiu-jitsu is tra traditional martial arts. What teachers, if I, I'm assuming there's some teachers that you, what teachers do you look up to or you look to for advice or uh, continue to learn jujitsu from? I think the best one is John Danaher. I think, I think in terms, so like if you like, what's the best teacher I think out there, John Danaher, I think is, is amongst the best, if not the best. And then what's the best competitor, Marcelo Garcia. So um, both, which is crazy, both are in New York City. And I, I recently did a trip down there, trained at both academies. Um, I think a good instructor is someone who isn't just involved with the technical aspect of it. Everyone is involved with the technique. And, and this isn't me bashing technique. Of course, you, technique is essentially leverage over the human body in jiu-jitsu, right? You learn a behavior that increases leverage over the human body. Technique is great, but everybody does technique. You can go on YouTube and learn the technique. You're not learning the conceptual understanding of each position, like the, the principles based on each position. Like if I'm passing guard, what's – What's the things to look out for? Well, it's the knee, it's the hip and the elbow. That's what's going to keep me away from side control if I'm on top. That's their weapon. So every pass should deal with that little triangle of, 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 of battle right there. So he, Danaher is very good at breaking down, I would say, more than just a technical understanding, but a conceptual. And he's been a huge influence in my life. And that's how I present my stuff. It's, it's conceptual. OK, so because the idea is like technique adjust because we have different body types, different variables, the concepts pretty much never change. And that's the idea. If you're like writing like this, is what I do when I write things, I'm like, I need two rules that are uncontroversial and then everything else stems from that. So mm -hmm. if you say, Dave, come up with a curriculum, I go, well, what are you trying to accomplish? And you tell me what you're trying to accomplish. I'll put it into what two rules and then all everything. That's when I can fill in the gaps because now I know exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Right. So I want to talk a little bit about the entrepreneurial journey because that's something I know I'm very interested in. I know my audience is very interested. The fact that you've been able to take this passion of yours and turn it into a, a full-time thing is amazing. So how did you first, obviously now you own your own gym, but what was the first dollar you ever made uh, from teaching jujitsu? Uh, I, I started teaching at Health's, but it was more, I think, a free membership, if I recall. So I was teaching for a free membership, which is good. Essentially, uh, Tim Ferriss did something on apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And I read it. I read the whole thing. And I'm like, that's like, I mean, everyone should read that on apprenticeship, I think it was called or something like that. And I was definitely an apprentice early on. Um, and essentially what you're doing is when you're an instructor in jiu-jitsu, you just want an audience. Yeah. You want an audience that has a spectrum which is always the case you got some over here that are absolutely they believe everything you're saying you got the middle ground and then you have people going and i have that today and i think that's what keeps me going i, I train sometimes i'm in a group with military people right these people gone to war and i'm sitting there presenting some ideas and i'll have that spectrum mm -hmm. and i have to remember try to grab this group who doesn't <laughs> doesn't get it's like nope this guy is you know because everyone's different um Make this group better, make this group, but try to grab that group. So then I, I, I come back, adjust things, my presentation gets better. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's the way to do it, is, is be an apprentice. The first dollar I ever made, I wasn't focused on making dollars. I was focused on training, learning, because I went to AK, for example. Got a, that was my first time I got a real job, actually. Okay, it was with AKA. But the idea wasn't I'm trying to make money. It's, yeah, the job needs to sustain me, but I'm still – an apprentice. And what that did, it, and I always talk about like avoiding distraction. A lot of the distractions in our lives are like, especially when you're young, you can do, when, you, when you're in your 20s, don't think about the money you're making. Mm. As long as it can sustain you, don't think, it's not the money. It's the wealth of knowledge that is, is just shooting at you. Um, and if you're in a situation, you have a job and you don't have that wealth of knowledge, 
move jobs because that's the currency we want. And so for me, I was exposed to world champion, you know, wrestlers, gold medalist wrestlers, gold medalist judoka, world champion Cain Velasquez. I was in this corner when he beat Brock Lesnar, uh, you know, all the multiple world champion MMA fighters. And I'm in this room constantly. And I wasn't thinking about the money in the beginning. I was just like, there's this flood of information. And I think that paved the, you know, the way for me to have my own career because I developed a major understanding of you know, a holistic approach of martial arts. I'm not a jujitsu guy. I'm not a judo guy. To me, I'm a martial artist who has all of these experiences. And if you have a question, let's talk about it. And I will share my experiences, learn from you, and hopefully you'll take something from it. So what was the transition or what inspired you to open up your own gym? Getting older. <laughs> you get older and then, it, you know, when you're younger, like when you're in your 20s, like I said, focus on the knowledge. Right. As you get older, you're like, okay, there's there's a point to where – I got to seize the moment in terms of, okay, now it's, I, I have a good framework to work with. Now it's time to, and then, uh, I had, you know, my wife was a huge influence with all these people around me that, uh, I, I started surrounding myself with millionaires mm. or just paying attention to them a little bit, you know, um, like one of those things who you surround yourself with, they're, they're going to be a wealth of knowledge for you. How do they act? You know, do they complain a lot? Do they, you know, how, how do they, what do they, how is their worldview? And mm. I think that was huge for me. And I, came in with a certain worldview and I started learning from all these people and my worldview changed. And, and to me, it's just maturity. And so I, they were an influence into me saying, okay, well now it's time for, this goes back to ego, self-interest. This goes back, okay, I need to create something. I need to create something for me and include my sphere of influence, the people I want to employ, the instructors that I have, my wife, now my, my, my family. Um, and so it was, Leaving AK, I think, was the – back in 2010, I think, was the, was like, okay, you know, being a mixed martial arts coach is a hobby. That's not a career. I mean, you just have to love that hobby. If I want a career, I need to, I need to be on my own. And, and it's all those, all those things that I, you know, read and it's like all the attitude – same thing. It's like I want to set my own atmosphere in my academy, my own culture – I want to create my own brand. I want to create my own curriculums. And with me and my partners like Matt Darcy and, and my wife, not just me, but like it's a collective uh, collective intelligence, if you will, that we're bouncing ideas back and forth. And we, we said we want to come out with the most professional, structured, you know, jiu-jitsu academy that caters to families. We have like almost 200 kids at our Pleasanton Academy alone. San Jose has roughly the same. And so our idea is like kids are bowing. They learn the respect aspect because what you're doing when you teach martial arts, I'm going off on a tangent, but when you do, when you teach martial arts is you're giving somebody leverage over the people around them in the physical realm. It's leverage over them. And so what we want to do is balance that out with the responsibility. We want good people to have that leverage. We don't want to just say fighting is cool and what you see in MMA and all that stuff is great. No, no, no. We want the traditional mindset to go in with that technical knowledge so they can carry that into their families and protect themselves if needed, but also have this confidence and then you utilize that like I have in, in, in their career. So you obviously, I mean, I can say this, you have a, a superior product to most jujitsu gyms, but that's a lot of times that's not enough. I know I've met a lot of different small business owners that have a great product, but their, their business isn't doing nearly as well as yours. What were you, how did you make it so successful? I mean, was there any marketing uh, that you did that was different from other people? I, I think you have to look at every aspect. Yeah. You look at, it's like, okay, the idea, even utilizing jiu-jitsu as a reference or mixed martial arts, I'll use that. Um, where are you deficient? Like Ronda Rousey. I just did a podcast on Ronda Rousey on my position impossible. And I outlined why she is in the situation she's in. First off, it starts with her mindset. So your mindset has to be like we talked about, never stop learning. One of the things Tim Ferriss told me when years ago when I used to live with the guy, um, never stop learning. So you, you have to have the mindset where I, I don't know everything. I need to continue this education. Um, and so quickly you go, well, if that's the mindset, then where are my deficiencies? Mm. You know, if I only 80, 20 principle, if I only have so much time, where am I going to invest? So in MMA, if I'm not a good striker, I invest time in my striking or at least in the transition to get to my grappling, right? If I'm a good grappler, Invest time in that 
in that transitional ability. Well, that's you obviously know where you're efficient. The, when, you, when you're getting punched in the face in a sparring session, where are you getting punched in the face? If it's when you're trying to grapple and get that clinch, you are deficient in that transition, closing that space. So it's easy in fighting because it's an immediate sanction. You get punched in the face. It's like put your hand in fire. So the idea is like we looked at, you know, people coming in, what they wanted, and we need to supply that. Because when they're coming in, they're first off, they're coming to us. And we need to give them an experience that is the most professional. One of the things I'll, I'll share with you. Somebody walked in my academy, and we've heard this a million times, and they go, man, this place smells good. <laughs> and I'm like, sometimes the simple things, like I, I've been years in academies, and they smell terrible. Mm -hmm. and, and they're just not kept. They're not well kept. Um, and I'm not trashing it. I love those days. Those days were awesome. I didn't mind. It's like when you go camping. You don't mind eating with your hands. You don't mind being dirty. I didn't mind it. But if it's going to be a future place where maybe my, my son takes it over or it's going to provide for my family, I need – and the people coming in, I need something that's just going to knock their socks off. So very simple and subtle things like that. Where am I deficient? If I'm deficient here, I need to remedy it. And if I can't do it, I need to find somebody to do it. Did you hire, out of curiosity, did you hire someone to help you with some of the marketing or did you just learn it yourself and figure it out? Our marketing is almost 100% almost social media. You know, it's word of mouth. Yeah. You know, if, if I impress families, they go and tell their friends which have families. Hmm. And that was, that was, I see a lot of jujitsu academies just catering to adults. That works if you're like a nine-time world champion. You know what I'm saying? Like if you have this like super – I'm not famous. I don't consider myself famous. I have to act as if I, 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 I have no fame at all. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the idea – and I learned this from Ego is the Enemy. It's a really good book. I just changed the, the word ego. It's this idea where, you know, I am this. No, no, I didn't think I'm this. At times I did, but – I didn't put myself up here. I had to constantly put myself down here and talk to people. And I learned, I did that learning how to teach. In the beginning when I was learning how to teach, it would, and if you took my class, it was horrendous. It was terrible. Because my mindset was like, how, why can't you do this? Mm -hmm. But then I, I'm not relating to you. I'm relating to me. That's me inside my head. So being a teacher, I had to adjust uh, my presentation, you know, me Thinking of who's in front of me and their experiences, not my experiences. Same thing with business. So I, I want to wrap up here. I have two last questions unrelated to jujitsu. The first one, just since he came up a, f a few times, do you have a favorite Tim Ferriss story or something that maybe uh, the listeners haven't heard before? Uh, I know I'm putting you on the spot a little, little bit. Yeah, here. with with Tim. Ah, uh, I can't think of an exact story. I think. Uh, some of the cool times when I, I rented a room from him at the time uh, and he was working on the four hour work week and I just, he was just a jujitsu guy. That was a smart guy to me. He, you know, it, it was just one of the, now you look at him and it's just, it's amazing what he's done and what he's, what he's done for all of us, including myself and yourself. Uh, but I think it, one of the cool times we did this practice, uh, we would practice interviews. And so I think I have footage somewhere. I, I don't know if I can find it, but like I would just interview him. And he would interview me and we would get better at receiving interviews. We would just get better at the idea of somebody talking to us and us coming up with these kind of quick answers. And, you know, hopefully I know what I'm doing on this one. But uh, the idea is, is what skill do I want to be good at? And he does this with his podcast and he'll just invite somebody on and say, well, if I want to be good at this skill, I'm going to invite you on. So we did a lot of that. He showed me chapters to his book and I was, we were going back and forth. So it's just the sharing of information with some wine. I don't think it was a specific story, but the idea is just like, I'm not a writer. I'm a jujitsu guy, but he wanted a jujitsu guy's opinion on writing. On does this make sense to you? Because he's a smart guy and he knows like his audience isn't, they're not all, that's another thing going back to the teaching. They're not all here with him. They're, they come from a different experience. They have wholly, totally different ways maybe of thinking. And he wants to relate his information to that person. And I think teaching, he's a teacher. When he writes a book, he's teaching you. And so, I don't know, just sharing good wine. You know what I mean? Like just Absolutely. sharing good wine but being productive. So like having a good conversation and laughing but the content of that conversation is just 
it's productivity. It's it's very uh, you know you're producing as you as you as you enjoy yourself. Absolutely. I mean, that's what I've found. My favorite friends aren't the friends that you know we drink, we go to the bar and pick up girls. It's the ones that we can have a few drinks and have a great conversation. And at the end of that conversation, I feel like wow, I'm a better person than when I started. So oh, I told- without without a doubt. The last question I have for you, and this is something I asked all my guests, if you could go back and give your 20-something self-advice, or more generally, for all the listeners here, if you could give advice to all us young 20-somethings, what kind of advice would you give us about life in general? Don't be so hard on yourself. Or find the balance. Like, I'm very hard on myself. I think it's a type A personality. It's just, it's it, you know, Tim talks about type A personalities. Um, just Google it, read it, and then I'm like, yes, yes, okay, I got it. So uh, don't be so hard on yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, and this is a little cliche when people talk about the mistakes that you make, there's things that kind of embarrass me when I think about it 20 years ago that I did in my twenties, but, uh, it's okay to make those mistakes. It's okay to embarrass yourself because essentially I'm, it's good thing that you're embarrassed by that because it adjusts behavior. That's one of the things, if you want to adjust your behavior, be embarrassed of, about your current behavior that you feel like you need to adjust. And so don't be so hard on yourself. Like I used to just be like, if I had a bad training session on Friday at San Jose State doing judo, <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, ruined mm. until Monday. And so that's that competitive, like very hard on myself. And I think I could have avoided that. I think I could have compartmentalized, meaning I had a bad training session on Friday, forget about it, have some fun on Saturday, Sunday, and then bring it back, reboot, zone in, bow in, and then move forward to, to, to smash, to smash the day. Absolutely. Dave, where can people find out more about you and everything you're doing? Uh, GorillaJujitsu.com, G-U-E-R-R-I-L-L-A, Jujitsu.com, and then uh, at Dave Camarillo on Instagram um, and Twitter. And I'll put links in the show notes for all the listeners. Dave, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. No, thank you very much. I had a great time. Appreciate it, man. Hey, guys. I hope you enjoyed that video. And if you did, make sure you hit the big red subscribe button down below. You can also check me out on Facebook and on Twitter. And I release a new video every Monday. And by hitting that subscribe button, you'll get those new videos every Monday. And this is really a podcast. It's also a website. You can check out the website. It's howtodoyour20s.com. I'll put a link right over here as well. And what it's all about is trying to improve your life. And we specifically focus on things that people in their 20s are interested in. So make sure you like the video if you liked it. Subscribe like us on Facebook and Twitter, whatever. But I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you again on another video.